Well, thank you, Jeff, and thanks to all of you for choosing to spend some time with us this evening. Um, I'd like to talk with you for the next few minutes about the concept of measurement. Now, measurement has played an instrumental role in the development of physical sciences, and engineering, and technology. And at this point in history, I think it would probably be difficult for me to overstate the value and the importance that measurement plays in every aspect of our lives. I mean, every time that we uh, get on an airplane, or eat food, or use a cell phone, or even step inside a building like this one, we're putting our trust in the results of measurements. And for the most part, that trust seems very well earned. Measurement is commonly associated with precision, with accuracy, and with objectivity. And against that backdrop, it seems little wonder that social scientists like myself have also tried to incorporate measurement into our activities for at least the past hundred years or so. And the logic for this seems fairly straightforward. <coughs> Given the clear usefulness of measurement in the physical sciences, should we social scientists not make at least a good faith attempt to see if measurement can add such value to the study of human beings as well? Well, flash forward to the present day, we now see at least claims about measurement in every area of social science. And one obvious example of this is, yes indeed, educational testing. And educational tests are commonly claimed to constitute measures of students' knowledge, skills, and abilities. Another major class, just as ubiquitous, although maybe slightly less controversial, are self-report survey-based questionnaires, which are used in fields like social and personality psychology and are commonly claimed as measures of personality factors, attitudes, dispositions, preferences, and especially more recently, positive personal qualities. And what I'm thinking of here are things like grit, growth mindsets, social and emotional intelligence, and self-regulation. These kinds of questionnaires usually consist of a short declarative sentence like, I am a hard worker which is an item on the grid scale, <laughs> followed by response options ranging, for example, from strongly disagree through strongly agree. Now, increasingly, we see these kinds of measures not only being used for basic research purposes, but also being used in situations with social consequences attached. I mean, just for example, there are at least nine school districts here in California that have begun to use these kinds of questionnaires for accountability purposes. So, to the extent to which these kinds of measures are claimed to provide the same kind of accurate, precise, and objective knowledge that we've come to expect from physical measures, I think it would make sense for us to expect to find very rigorous quality control procedures in place. Now, a common approach in many domains of scientific inquiry is that whenever we come up with a new idea or theory, we put that theory to the test by deliberately attempting to show that it's wrong. And if our theory survives these kinds of attempts at falsification, then we might have some reason to start trusting it. Now this, of course, requires that we take the stance of a skeptic about our own beliefs and try to subject our beliefs to potentially disconfirming evidence. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think that we are necessarily following such a rigorous strategy in some areas of social science. In fact, I think that we might have something of a confirmation bias, meaning we preferentially seek out the kind of information we think will support our theories. Now to say a bit more about this, I have to say a few words about uh, how uh, quality control or validation often takes place in the context of these self-report surveys uh, and other questionnaires. Now, I won't get too far into the technical details. I do have a paper I'm happy to share. Uh, but just in terms of broad strokes, in general, we find that there are basically three activities that comprise validation. The first is that we look at the reliability of a scale. And that basically has to do with its consistency or stability. The second is we employ a class of statistical models called latent variable models, usually something called factor analysis. And third, we look at the extent to which scores on these questionnaires correlate with scores on other questionnaires or outcomes depending on the theory. Now, all of these techniques, I think, have proven track records of providing many valuable forms of feedback to test developers and users. So I'm not intending to criticize these techniques per se. But I do become concerned when these techniques are taken in and of themselves as providing a rigorous check on the quality of our measures. Now, for one thing, it might be observed that it seems very rare for these techniques to be applied and return falsifying or even discouraging results. 
And this suggests one of two things. Either we social scientists are really good at creating high quality measures, and with considerably less effort per measure than physicists and engineers, I might add. <laughs> or these techniques might be giving us too rosy a picture of what's really going on. At some point, I became curious as to just how far I could push this. What if, for example, I were to render survey questions unintelligible by replacing some keywords with nonsense? So, for example, instead of I am a hard worker, we have I am gaba guy. As far as I know, no one knows what that word means. So, to be clear, I have no theory concerning what I'm measuring or how I'm measuring it. And using that language of falsification from earlier, if ever there were a time when a theory deserved to be falsified, this would appear to be that time. So, believe it or not, I did this, administering survey items like this in an online sample. And by the way, I kind of buried these items after some more legitimate looking questionnaire items. Uh, in a follow-up study, I tried to take it one step further, and I just got rid of the semantics entirely, gave people items like this one. That's not Latin, by the way, it's just gibberish. <laughs> And in the follow-up study after that, I took it yet one uh, more step further and said, what would happen if we simply got rid of the items? So you have that. Yeah, there's still a response scale there, but there's nothing to agree or disagree with. I got some very interesting emails while I was doing this, by the way. <laughs> but people filled it out, and I bet you can see the punchline coming. Once I got all the data back, and I applied these validation procedures that I had mentioned earlier, I got very positive results. Excellent reliability, excellent fit to factor models. These are technical results that would not be out of place in top social science journals. Now, to be clear, I am not at all claiming that all research based on surveys is categorically invalid or anything like that. But that said, if I can get such positive looking results using such silly questionnaire items, that would at least seem to cast doubt on the capacity of our quality control procedures to catch us when we get off track. Now, the social sciences are a lot younger than the physical sciences, and we deal with much more complex subject matter, arguably. So for these reasons, I don't think there's any reason for us to feel embarrassed by the fact that our discipline is not yet as mature as our big sisters in physics and chemistry and biology. But part of the way that we all become more mature is we find out we're not always right. So, maybe we social scientists would do well to let go a little bit of our need to show that we're always right about measuring. Start looking for more ways to be productively wrong. Thanks for your time.